of your great name. Hungry souls receive grace at the sound of your great name. The fatherless, they find their rest at the sound of your great name. The sick are healed and the dead are raised at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. All the world will praise your great name, your great name, Redeemer, my healer, Lord Almighty, my Savior, Defender, you are my King, Redeemer, my healer, Lord Almighty, my Savior, Defender, you are my King, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, you are high and lifted up. And all the world will praise your great name. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. And all the world will praise your great name. I love to tell 
because I love to tell a story about my Savior. You know, I'm so glad this morning. We missed last Sunday because Nancy was sick. She's been sick for about two weeks with a summer cold, but she's feeling better today, and it's good to be back in the house of God. So let's bow our heads and pray this morning. Father, we are so thankful this morning, Lord. We are blessed people, Lord, here in this church and in this country. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for all of our preachers and our ministers around the country, Lord. We pray for our leaders. God, we pray for each one that is here this morning. We pray your richest blessings upon them. Lord, now we come to this portion of the service, Lord, where we give back to you, Lord, for you can, your work can go forward, Lord, and win other souls for Christ. And we give you the praise in Jesus' holy name. Amen. <laughs>
Amen. Wonderful job. It's good to be here this morning. I'm so grateful that you're here. And uh, I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Psalms, chapter 60 and verse 11. We uh, are taking off a, a week from the Mark study, and I want to address America's current violence, and I want to do it from a biblical perspective. And you may not agree with what I have to say, and that's fine, but I want you to at least hear what I have to say because it's so important. It is truly a destructive tide that is deteriorating the very fabric of our country, and it's at a frightening pace. Our only hope is to turn to God. Our only hope is to recognize that man's help won't work. Because any hope that is founded upon the hope of man and a human being, because a man-made philosophy or a man-made religion or an institution simply won't change this problem because we're placing our hope and our faith in a misplaced place. I think it's time that we take an introspective look at our own lives. I'm not asking about those out there. I'm, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about us corporately. And if this situation and this climate is going to change, and there's going to truly be a long-term effective change, and where we're headed will be reversed, it's only going to happen through those of us who believe and are willing to engage our culture and make a difference. And if we are unwilling to engage our culture, and if we are unwilling to get out of our comfort zones, and if we are unwilling to speak about issues that have severe repercussions, uh, both personally and politically, we need to understand we must take a stand. So I want you to stand with me. I'm going to read one verse. <clears throat> And then I'm going to address two very important issues. Now, let me just simply say, <clears throat> I can't solve the problem in 30 minutes. But I think I can head us in the right direction. So I want you to listen. Psalm chapter 60 verse 11 says, Give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. Father in heaven, I pray that we might take our responsibility, we might take our needs, our hopes, our dreams, our plans, our future to you. And Lord, I pray that you would give divine wisdom and guidance. I pray that we would seek you with all of our heart, that we would love all peoples, and we'd make a difference in the lives of those closest to us. We would start at home. And Father, we would start in our church, and we would start in our community. And Lord, we would see the repercussions that grow from that in a positive way, in a healing way. Lord, that we could be very cathartic, get rid of our pain, and begin to embrace the solutions. For I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> the first thing I want to do is address the issue of killing of police officers. In our country today, I was, I've been sharing with a number of people, I, in, in my entire lifetime, I'm soon to be 55 years old, the 60s probably were as turbulent as these times, but I was a young person, so it's hard for me to go back and understand. But in my lifetime, I believe there's more civil unrest in our country than I have ever seen. And I think that it's time that we as a church begin to take responsibility, our responsibility, for our failings, and that we stand up and, and we engage and we change and we offer solutions to the problems of violence and the problems of race and reconciliation. The horrific shootings that we've experienced nationally have touched every single one of us and shaken all of us. I can tell you that very, very personally. Sandy and I went with our children and our grandchildren to Orlando, as I spoke briefly about last week. But we went to a water park. And as we got there early because we wanted to be in the shade, I wanted to be in the shade. And I found us seating as I rushed to that area. <clears throat> 
And we put our cooler there with our water and our Gatorade and, and our food. And, and we were there alone. We were in a perfect place. And we got our chairs organized. And then we went off to the water park to do uh, different and various things. When we came back, there were about 40 people surrounding us. They weren't Caucasians. They were blacks. And for the very first time in my life, because I, we grew up in my family, you were not racist. My grandmother, my grandfather instilled it in their children and instilled it in us. My mother instilled it in us. So we are not, we are not against any race. But for the very first time in my life, when I have worked in the military and I've been around all nationalities, but for the very first time in my life, I found that my head was on a swivel and I was looking and watching and I could feel the tension between the races. It was a very sad experience. So I want to address that, but first I want to address the killing of police officers. And bear with me and listen to me. Some of you have had bad experiences, I understand. Some of you deserve the experience you had. First off, I want you to understand clearly the reality of evil. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, it says, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I want you to understand evil is real and evil is painful. And evil right now seems to be running rampant without any bridle. We've all experienced that. But I want you to understand the good news. It is only temporary. Evil will pass away when Jesus returns. The problem is, that's not right now. He hasn't returned. So we're still living in this broken, evil, fallen world. But there's something that we can do. In Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 5, verse 6, he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. The, the, the reality of the issue is this. As followers of Christ, it's time that we begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Amen. Now, why must we do this? Because Proverbs 13, I believe, 14, verse 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation. It builds a nation up. But sin is a reproach to any people. And where we're at currently in our sinful, broken America is we are unrighteous. We are not seeking the righteousness of God. We are seeking our own way. We're like the period of the judges when every man did what was right in his own eyes. It's time that we once again come under the umbrella of the Word of God as followers, regardless of our denominational differences, and say we are going to collectively make a difference and heal our nation. But if our nation is going to be healed, we must become a righteous people. The second thing I want you to understand under this umbrella of the killing of police officers is this. <clears throat> Respectability for all officers. All officers. I did not say all officers are good. I did not say all officers are fair. But there must be respectability for the police officers. And if we don't have respectability for the police officers, then we're going to have problems. It is time for the church to stand up together without stuttering and without stammering and say, as the Word of God says in Romans chapter 13 and verse number 4, here's what it says about our police officers. He is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil... Be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now I want you to understand something. That word minister is the same word minister that God, just as I am a minister of God, and the police officers that are called to that field, they are called as ministers representing God, and they are answerable to God. Now, what does that mean for us, though, as 
citizens, kingdom citizens, that means we respect that authority. It means we fall under their authority. Police officers, as they are called ministers, are called to do what they do. So what must we do? Number one, we must teach our family to honor the police. It starts at home. It starts at home. You teach your children and your grandchildren and any other child that you can influence, you teach them to honor the police. You say, what about the bad ones? What about the bad ones? Well, I want you to understand something. <clears throat> the cases that we hear about are few and far between with a number of cases that law officers respond to. Have there been some bad things happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. Wrong things? I don't know. Well, you know, when you're standing and you see something, you only see one side of an issue, and it's very easy to draw conclusions and you could be inaccurate. So you need to reserve your judgment until judgment is issued. But I want you to understand in the research that I did this week, and I've done a great deal of research this week, of all the cases that we hear about, it's infinitesimal compared to all the law officers and what they do. Now I want to play a video for you, and maybe you've seen it, maybe you have not. It's about two minutes. It's a Paul Harvey video about our officers. Policeman. <clears throat> a policeman is a composite of what all men are, I guess, a mingling of saint and sinner, dust and deity. Called at statistics, wave the fan over stinkers, underscore instances of dishonesty and brutality because they are news. What that really means is that they are exceptional, they are unusual, they are not commonplace. Buried under the fraud is the fact. And the fact is that less than one half of one percent of policemen misfit that uniform. And that is a better average than you'd find among clergymen. What is a policeman? He of all men is at once the most needed and the most wanted. A strangely nameless creature who is sir to his face and pig or worse behind his back. He must be such a diplomat that he can settle differences between individuals so that each will think he won, but if a policeman is neat, he's conceited. If he's careless, he's a bum. If he's pleasant, he's a flirt. If he's not, he's a grouch. He must make instant decisions which would require months for a lawyer, but if he hurries, he's careless. If he's deliberate, he's lazy. He must be first to an accident, infallible with a diagnosis. He must be able to start breathing, stop bleeding, tie splints, and above all, be sure the victim goes home without a limp or expect to be sued. The police officer must know every gun, draw on the run, and hit where it doesn't hurt. He must be able to whip two men twice his size and half his age without damaging his uniform and without being brutal. If you hit him, he's a coward. If he hits you, he's a bully. A policeman must know everything and not tell. He must know where all of the sin is and not partake. The policeman from a single human hair must be able to describe the crime, the weapon, the criminal, and tell you where the criminal is hiding, but if he catches the criminal, he's lucky. If he doesn't, he's a dunce. If he gets promoted, he has political pull. If he doesn't, he's a dullard. The policeman must chase bum leads to a dead end, stake out ten nights to tag one witness who saw it happen but refuses to remember. He runs files and writes reports until his eyes ache to build a case against some felon who will get dealed out by a shameless Seamus or an honorable who isn't honorable. The policeman must be a minister, a social worker, a diplomat, a tough guy, and a gentleman. And of course he'll have to be a genius because he'll have to feed a family on a policeman's salary. In the case, in the cases of when a police officer overreacts or a police officer is unjust, they need to be held accountable.
but not from us. Reserve your judgments. It is so easy to be hypercritical. I want you to understand something else. In a lot of those cases where the police officer uh, has been criticized or overreacting, oftentimes that overreaction is precipitated by the suspect resisting and defying government authority. I want you to see this passage of Scripture out of Romans 13.2. Whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment upon themselves. It's time that we teach our children, and I know some people say you shouldn't say this, John, but I'm going to say it, that you don't say no when a police officer is interrogating you. You don't say no when a police officer has stopped you. You don't say no when he says put your hands upon the dash or the wheel. You don't say no when he says don't reach for your wallet or whatever else you're reaching for. You don't resist a police officer. To resist a police officer, according to that passage of scripture, is to resist God himself. He said those are strong words. They are. And if you do what a police officer does, ask you to do 99.999% of the time, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Let me move to the next thing with, with, with this same issue. And that is the necessity for forgiveness. Because we are at a place in our country where we're not forgiving one another. We are harboring grudges and hatred. And we are festering the problem, and it's becoming worse and worse. When I think of these recent shootings of police officers in Dallas and Baton Rouge, the motivation of the shooter was to kill police officers. That's what it was. We're going to kill an officer. And they were doing this in retaliation of black lives lost. And I want you to know, it is a tragedy when anyone loses their life, black or white. But I want you to understand something. As I said earlier, we don't know all the details yet. Reserve your judgment. Watch the passage of Scripture that we have out of Romans 12. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. We have a choice in how we respond to wrongdoing. And our choice must be biblical. We don't need to try to settle the score ourselves and say, I've been hurt, I will hurt, tit for tat. That's what the shooters have done in these situations. And when they have done this, it not only destroys the shooters' lives, but it destroys the lives of everyone they come in contact with. The police officer, the police officer's family, fellow officers, moms and dads, children, and so many others. It, uh, that ripple effect hurts that city, that state, and our nation as a whole. It's time that we stand up and say, no more. Not in our country. We refuse. So how should we respond to evil and wrongdoing? How, how, what should we do? How, how should we take a stand? Because we know what happens. Well, maybe you're very familiar, and I, I'm sure that you are. I think that we need to take the option that the members of the Emanuel Methodist Church in Charleston, South Carolina took. I think that was probably the greatest expression of Christianity that's been seen cross-racially in my lifetime. How they handled that situation when a shooter entered their building and their fellowship as Dylan Roof came in, a white man, he killed nine black believers and he hurt their families forever. Don't you understand something? The families of those slain said to Dylan Roof, we forgive you. There was an article in Time Magazine that I read when that happened, and that article basically dealt with is forgiveness, is it, should it be given now? And it, absolutely it should be given now. Forgiveness should be given immediately. And they weren't excusing what he did. 
And they weren't giving up the desire for justice to be done. They were hurt. They'd lost people they loved. But I want you to hear these comments. These are from the members. You were representing the family of Ethel Lynch, is that correct? And you were whom, ma'am? The daughters. The daughters. I'm listening. And you can talk to me. I just want to have a daughter to know. To you. I forgive you. You took something very precious away from me. I would never talk to her ever again. I would never be able to hold her again. But I forgive you. And have mercy on your soul. You hurt me. You hurt a lot of people. But God forgive you. And I forgive you. Thank you, ma'am. Your name, sir? Anthony Thompson. Mr. Thompson. I would just like him to know that. Speak up for me. I can go in here. Saying the same thing that was just said. You know, I forgive you and my family forgive you. But we would like you to take this opportunity to repent. Repent. Confess. Give your life to the one who matters the most, Christ. So that he can change it, can change your ways no matter what happened to you, and you'll be okay. Do that, and you'll be better off than what you are right now. Thank you, sir. Your name, ma'am? Felicia Sanders. Thank you, Ms. Sanders, for being here. We welcome you Wednesday night in our Bible study with open arms. You have killed some of the most beautiful people that I know. Every fiber in my body hurts. And, and I'll never be the same. Tawanza Sanders is my son, but Tawanza was my hero. Tawanza was my hero. But as we say in a Bible study, we enjoyed you, but may God have mercy on you. Thank you, ma'am. What they were saying is, <clears throat> we're not going to seek vengeance. We're not going to seek harm for you. We forgive you. We want you to repent and turn to the one who can save your soul. They were saying, we'll let God settle the score in our justice system. But we're not going to let you continue to destroy our lives, even though you've taken those most precious to us away. We choose not to hold on to that and allow it to destroy our lives, but we move forward. And as followers of Jesus Christ, you and I have no choice but to move forward. And when we do, when we choose to forgive, we set the prisoner free, and the prisoner is us. 1961... Albert Bandura did his famous Bobo doll experiment. And that experiment, if you know what a dope Bobo doll is, it has weight in the bottom. It's a, it's a blow up and, and you hit it and it bounces back up on, off the floor. He did his, that famous experiment and uh, he taught social learning theory. And he said people learn through a number of things, three basic things, observing, imitating, and modeling. Our nation has learned from observing, imitating, and modeling. And we have learned violence. We have learned to hurt and kill and maim. It is seen on our television screen. It is seen from Hollywood. It is seen on our video games. It is taught from such a young age. They took these children in a room, these, these, these young boys and girls, and an adult would be acting violently toward this Bobo doll. And you know what? After they left the room and put them in another setting, those children, do you know what they did? Almost every single time, they acted out in violence as well. We have taught this. Do you know that the greatest single predictor of violence isn't religion? It's not. 
It's not. It's not occupation. It's not race. You know what it is? <clears throat> it's gender. It's gender. 98% of those who have committed mass shootings are males. 90% of those who commit homicide by shooting are males. We try harder to understand why people choose violence and harm rather than focusing on the deadly result that the intent produces. I think it's time for us to change. We need to come together. We need to come together and upon our land. It's time we come together not as African Americans and not as Native Americans and not as Asian Americans. And not as white America or European Americans or Haitian Americans or Cuban Americans or anything else. It's simply time that we come together as Americans. And we say we will solve this problem. Red, yellow, black, and white, they are all precious in his sight. We are all equal at the foot of the cross. We need to pray for our police officers. We need to pray for the families of those who've lost loved ones. We need to pray for our governments. We need to pray for our president. We need to pray for Congress. We need to pray for our governors. We need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for our believers. We need to pray that change would happen. And these recent events, a few weeks back, came out with an article, 40 Years of Violence in America. I read through that and I thought, no, I think I could go back further than 40 years. I think I would go back further than 40 years. The question then is what do we need to do? What, how, how do we change? Well, let me tell you the hope for America. It's in one passage of Scripture, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, you see the responsibility is upon us as a church. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. For there to be real change in America or for America to be great again, we must have revival. Revival comes from two Latin words, re and verve. Re means, again, verve means to live. So if we're going to live again as a nation, then we must seek the face of God. And we must ask God to move in and for us to move out. And if we're going to live again and change our land, we must pray that heaven would send a revival. Because a revival gives life back to a lifeless person, a lifeless family, a lifeless church, and a lifeless nation. Our nation can be one again, if we'll seek the Lord. The French political philosopher Alexis de Tocqueville said over a hundred years about America, a hundred years ago about America. He went through the small towns and the cities of America and he concluded something about America. He said, America is great because America is good. But if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. And we have ceased to be good. We have ceased to be good. Can we change? Yes. But listen closely. The answer isn't taking guns out of people's hands or putting guns in people's hands. There's only one way to change. First, it's individually. I, I, it starts with me. I must humble myself before Almighty God and say, God, start this revival in me. Start with me. Humble myself and pray. And then the second thing I must do, I must seek the face of God and I must turn from my wicked ways. Because I'm part of the problem just like you're part of the problem. And it's time we took responsibility. But let me move on to the next thing that I want to speak. The church. Here's the real tragedy. 
Here's the real tragedy. Too often the church has basically been this. We have become a place that is informational, informational and inspirational. And our weekly gatherings have been basically bringing a group of people together and trying to inform them or inspire them. But I think what needs to happen is a group of people need to come together and represent God upon this earth and go out and infect a difference. And we need to look from heaven's viewpoint and not earth's viewpoint. And the church and only the church has been given the keys of the kingdom of God. And it's time we start using those keys to transform our nation. If we want greater heavenly intervention in our lives and in our nation that deal with these earthly catastrophes that we've seen so often, then we need to pray and turn, and then God will hear. Now, the church secondly, the church secondly must become a place where we move from membership. You know what I mean by that? means it's not enough to have your name on the church row and attend. It's time for you to grow as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. And when you grow as a follower of Jesus Christ, just like that black Methodist church, the response that you will have will be the response that they have. I forgive. My life has been changed. It's been shattered. But I choose to forgive. What must we do thirdly? Thirdly. We must come together in our communities as a church to do good works. You say, oh, you're preaching the social gospel now. Jesus went about doing what? G-O-O-D. Jesus went about doing good. And it's time that we emptied out of our buildings and we begin to go into our communities and make a difference. I think we need to integrate our community by reaching out to our schools. At-risk children. We need to adopt a school. We need to make a difference. We need to, to work with local governing officials. We need to work with the police. We need to do all of these things. And unless we take these steps collectively as a body of believers, not just Salem First Baptist Church, but all churches, but we must do it. We can't determine what anyone else does, but we must do our part. Then we begin to fulfill God's given role of influencing our communities and future generations. If we don't, we'll see this continual spiraling downward. More hate, more resent, more fear. But we must not let fear divide us. We must not let hate separate us. We must embrace peace, love, unity, and as Martin Luther King said, we must do it with nonviolence. It's time for the rallying cry to be, I will choose love and not hate. And I will not seek vengeance when I've been hurt. It must start. Today, it must start here, it must start with me, it must start with you, and it must go from this building into our communities. If you truly want to seek and hunger and thirst for righteousness, that's the beginning place. We get to choose. But my choice is... We're going to do something. We're going to change. We're going to change. So here's the invitation. Strange message for a, I know, a little different, but here's, here's the deal. I don't want what's going on in our country to continue to you. My grandchildren will grow up in a world that I didn't have to grow up in. Our children... This is all they know. It's all they know. Isn't it time that those innocent eyes don't see these horrific acts of violence? Amen. Would you join with me? We're going to do some unusual things upcoming months. We're going to, I'm going to have officers come. I'm going to have 
I'm going to have county officials come. We're going to have some people come and give five, ten-minute talks about what they do and how we can help them. We're going to change. You say, we don't have a race problem. We have a hatred problem. We have a hatred problem. We have a problem of evil. And we're going to change. We're going to change. So I'd like to ask you to come and pray. Humble yourself and seek his face. It's our only hope. Father, I pray you'd change me. You'd change us. That fear would be removed. Faith would fill that void. Hope and change. And we will be great again as a people because you're a great God. So, Lord, help us to become what we must. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and come as you have needs. I pray that you'll pray for our country. Pray that you'll pray for you.